Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teacher Talks. My name is Christopher Hansen. have the distinct privilege of serving my community as the Director of Music Education and Orchestral Activities at Seattle Pacific University. If this is your first time joining, welcome. Teacher Talks is an opportunity to connect to artists and educators all over the world and talk about the transformative power of the arts in our daily lives. This is sponsored by the student organization at SPU called the Falcon Feathers. It stands for Future Educators in the Arts, Transforming Human Experience and Realities. This started as just an opportunity to stay connected when the pandemic began this past spring and I am so grateful to my colleagues and friends that have connected with me and allowed me to continue these conversations over the summer through the fall and now going into the winter and spring of 2021. I am so grateful to have one of my good friends and colleagues Dr. James Ray with us today. Um, this is his fourth appearance on Teacher Talks. He's becoming a regular, uh, and I'm so grateful for his time and his wisdom. We connected very casually over the phone as we were both scrambling to understand higher ed after we were leaving teaching high school, and uh, immediately, I think, sort of so hit it off and uh, made a connection as we navigated this new world we were working in, and so I have brought uh, James back a couple times just sort of talk about what life is like right now during this pandemic and how we are preparing future educators, what that ultimately looks like, uh, particularly since we both have sort of unique perspectives in higher ed coming from a state institution, coming from private liberal arts school, um, both coming from teaching high school orchestras and now preparing future music educators, particularly instrumental, secondary instrumental educators. Um, so a lot of commonalities, but different perspectives that I hope will enrich conversations that you are having with colleagues and friends and ultimately help us sort of push the needle forward, as it were, on the, the bigger idea of what it looks like to prepare teachers for this new world we're living in. So today I wanted to connect with James to do just that and get a new perspective. So we had, we had connected, I think, for the first time last spring, right in the midst of the pandemic. We talked a little bit over the summer to try to figure out, you know, how are we preparing for the new year? We talked uh, pretty recently at the end of the fall quarter, talking about how we sort of survived this fall quarter. And so now I wanted to connect again to, uh, again, sort of talk about the anticipation of winter quarters and spring semesters as we go into this new area. I say new because it's, it's challenging that it seems like we're always trying to stay ahead of what's going on with the pandemic and you just can't. Um, you know, there was speculation that over the summer things would change and we'd be in person uh, teaching in the fall. And then we got a lot of hybrid models and some people doing fully online. And then there was conversations about uh, being able to go back in person or promote hybrid instruction across all colleges and universities, at least in the state of Washington, going into the winter and the spring. And now that has changed because cases have started spiking in Washington again and the governor's put in new proclamations. So it seems like, at least from my perspective, every time there's sort of a plan in place, it immediately has to be changed. It has to evolve. But now we're starting to see, which is, is really fascinating, and without uh, denying people the right to recognize how they're suffering and how they're struggling through this pandemic, uh, we're starting to see scholarship, which, which excites me. I like to see that other people are thinking about how we're preparing teachers, how we're talking about teaching, in the pandemic, after the pandemic, and starting some of those bigger conversations. And we're starting to see that. Journals and conferences are being set up to address issues that are happening. Whereas in the spring and even in the summer, people were still sort of scrambling to figure out what that looks like, but now we're living through it. We've got a semester and quarters behind us, so to speak, and we're learning so much from that. So there's a lot going on, right? There's, there's a lot of conversation just circulating. And I'm, again, so grateful for Dr. Ray's time to be able to connect and sort of talk about what the world looks like for him and what it looks like in larger conversations that I know he's been having with Asta and everyone else. And if you haven't seen it, shameless plug, uh, Dr. Ray has been publishing some really great pieces on social justice and equity, uh, which I hope will become a series. And uh, he's been doing this work. And that is another piece that's come up in 2020 that we have to balance. It's, it's now just not a matter of dealing with technology and online instruction and the health needs of our students and faculty across the country, but now also dealing with social unrest. Of that we're seeing, not just politically, but in terms of race relations and identities of students, whether it's gendered 
or race or religion or if it's a socioeconomic status. So there's just a lot going on. I mean, that's the understatement of the millennia. There's a lot going on, and we're trying to figure out how we're navigating it. I always like to give a few minutes. We're about five minutes in, so I think we've we've got a few people watching. I always encourage those of you that are watching, please feel free to contribute questions and comments that you have. We're live streaming on Facebook and on YouTube, and as you post those, we'll be able to see them. So please feel free to add your comments and questions. Let us know that you're here. Uh, but let me go ahead. I'm going to stop talking. And James, I want to check in with you. How are things going? We're both in the same boat that we're seeing students on Tuesday. We're going right back into thick of it. Got meetings tomorrow to kind of be prepared. How's life going for you? How are you preparing for this uh, this winter, this spring? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, <laughs> just just kind of going off some of the things you were hitting. What, what's the saying? The only thing constant is change. <laughs> <laughs> And just in terms of, you know, what to expect in terms of what's happening in person, what's happening online. And and, and one of the things I'm finally start to, starting to understand the groove of is what's happening um, in the K-12 setting isn't necessarily a predictor or, or, or telling us what's going to happen in the higher ed setting um, for, for all kinds of reasons as I look at the information coming from, you know, different public school districts, including my own kids here in Ferndale, Washington. Um, just the way that looks versus what our uh, what, what our higher ed institutions, mine and, and, and others, are saying about what, you know, the the, the, the new calendar year 2021 is going to look like as, as people are getting back from break. It's just, it's different. And, and, and so trying to use one to predict the other, I, I, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. finding it's kind of an exercise in futility. <laughs> so it's just kind of uh, being ready to just uh, roll with the punches. Yeah. And, and 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 I think too, just stepping back and recognizing that nobody is nobody is embracing this chaos in terms of that's what they're trying to create. <laughs> uh, no one is 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 out to confuse. It's just it's a confusing time. And I think one of the themes that I hear coming from, you know, the different changes in terms of uh, health recommendations, especially at the local level is, yeah, things are changing because the, the behavior of the pandemic is changing. You know, yeah. we, we, we all wanted to say that, hey, you know, let's um, let, let, let's plan on, on getting back on campus, whatever campus is uh, in January. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as this recent surge, as that plays out, obviously those plans have to change. And, and I think we all have to just be OK with the fact that, you know, just because, you know, we, we projected this one scenario two or three weeks ago i mean if if, if the circumstance becomes such that it's just untenable i mean it, it would be irresponsible to <laughs> to just kind of march forward with that <laughs> and so so i i think that's one of the things that i find myself getting used to hmm. And it was interesting. I, I was out this morning coming back from, uh, I was doing a walk at a local park here, um, uh, just exercising. And I was thinking about that the, there was a new story playing about this new strain, that, that this new more infectious COVID strain that they've yeah. now uh, verified is here in the U.S. And they're reinforcing the importance of all the measures that they're talking about, the masking, the social distancing, the, 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 the avoiding gatherings whenever possible. And I was just thinking about, you know, for myself and my family, we're kind of used to that and we've just grown accustomed to not to not engaging in those kinds of things in terms of gathering with folks and all of that and on the one hand i felt um kind of reassured by that in terms of okay this thing is more infectious but we're not around people anyway so hopefully the measures we're taking will will, will kind of keep us safe but at, at the same time like immediately at the same time i was also really saddened you know yeah. and, I, and i'm wondering oh my gosh have i have, have, have i just uh, written off a part of my humanity in terms of actually being physically around other human beings and and i'm sitting here saying i'm used to not doing that after almost a year i mean in a way it's it's kind of a low level terrifying <laughs> yeah so yeah. so and, and it made me wonder that you know once we get past all of this and and i'm looking forward to what, what are they saying summer fall when hopefully hopefully uh the the, the vaccination rate will be high enough set so we can start to re resume uh life as quasi normal i'm really hoping that um we have an easy time tra retransitioning uh, yeah. to use a, a, a form and analysis phrase, retransitioning kind of back into that. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I'm just kind of a humorist, though. I can imagine everything just being really awkward <laughs> those first couple of oh, days absolutely. or so. <laughs> what are all the, I mean, everyone's just used to keeping six feet and, you know, <laughs> not, not having faces covered and all this other stuff. So I think that I think we're all going to have this this bizarre social awkwardness phase that <laughs> hopefully hopefully will just be funny and hopefully not be long lasting yeah. and, and indicative of, of some greater social breakdown. I mean, and so I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of riffing here, but. But that's kind of where my headspace is as I'm thinking about resuming for what what else is going to be a, a, a winter quarter. I know you're on the quarter system too. Yeah. Um, starting up this Tuesday, and as I did the last couple of terms, I'm I personally I'm teaching all online again, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've just been kind of trying to hit the pavement since uh, since off and on really over the break, but especially in the last little bit here of getting my courses ready. Um, Canvas has kind of become a lifeline for me. Right. And, yep. and, and I've got it to where I'm teaching a couple of different classes. I'm teaching low string pedagogy and I'm teaching um, uh, music theory. And so getting all those ready, I've got, you know, it, it's interesting because you're preparing to teach these things online, but at the same time as a teacher, one of the things we always do, you know, the, whenever we're coming back to teach something again, you don't want to do it exactly the same way. So you're thinking about ways you can change things up, improve, you know, take this out, put this back in. Something you would be doing anyway, but now you're doing it as you're trying to put it all online. <laughs> and, and so yeah. I've been I've been wrestling with that too. <laughs> um, and, and, and things are pretty close to ready to go in terms of what the students will see at first. I, I I, I'm, I'm doing a lot with uh, videos, pre-recorded video lectures. And so I, I've got kind of in true backward design form. I figured out the curricular aspects we wanted to do. I've, I've checked in on all the assessments and made adjustments and updates where necessary. And now it's the planning of the actual instruction. And so my, my next big task is to start, start shooting some videos. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, I mean, you, you also just touched on so many important things looking forward just quickly to touch on this i am very anxious about what you know going back to this as you say quasi normal state where we're going to have in-person instruction what that really does look like because i have freshmen right now that i've never been in the same room with right you know that have that have been a part of my program in another yeah. state and they only know us through being online and from my own perspective, there's a deficit. You know, the fact that we haven't been in the same room and have been able to connect, you know, physically in the same space and exercise certain strategies and such, that's a deficit that they have. And especially, too, I'm worried about the social intellectual divisions that might exist amongst my freshman class, because I do have some freshmen they were adamant. They wanted to be in person. They're staying on campus. They came in in the fall and they took as many in-person classes as possible. Um, SPU, because it's a smaller institution, and we've had this conversation before, but for people that might be watching that are curious, so we've been in hybrid instruction since the fall. We came back in September with hybrid instruction and we were one of the few institutions in the state of Washington to do it and sustained it. We had the entire fall quarter with some classes in person, some classes that were hybrid, which meant a lot of different things where it might be like a three credit course where one day you meet in person and the other day it's online, or there's a certain amount of asynchronous learning, but then there are like certain checkpoints throughout the quarter. I had some colleagues that did that. Like they met like a total of five times the whole quarter, but they had a lot of asynchronous instruction. Um, some were split where, and I taught a class this way that a majority of my students were on campus and coming and then some of them were online and so they would zoom in and so I had a zoom screen going and the students in class, which was surreal. And I'm, I'm grateful to a certain extent that I feel like I've been able to experience every mode of teaching and learning during this because I've just kind of tried it out with a lot of different classes that I'm because I'm still an ensemble director. So I've kind of tried out like, what does it look like if we're in person? What if it looks like we're only online? What if there's a mix of that? What, you know, what if I only require them to come in on certain days? And again, to your point, I'm still figuring it out. I don't, there's not an answer. And it's, it really depends on the topic. It depends on what the assessments are going to look like. And I think that's one of the greater challenges that I've had is trying to balance my own personal desires as an educator of how I think education should be fulfilled, what those educational experiences should look like, and what my students really need 
and of course, when we're talking about student needs, like I'm, I'm thinking Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like I'm thinking just for them to feel safe, for mm -hmm. them to feel comfortable with the learning environment, for their needs to be met in order to be in a space where they can learn, to be in that zone of proximal learning, right? Like where, where can I challenge them and where can they feel like they're going to be successful? So I really am going back to which is, you know, again, if I'm nerding out, I push my glasses up. Like when I'm nerding out as an educator of educators, I love it intellectually. This is a beautiful challenge, especially coming from teaching public school and now being in higher ed. There's a part of me intellectually just, just flourishing because I'm like, yes, I get to think philosophically and critically about how I'm doing what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to plan out my calendar and the personal side of me says, I need my students in the room with me. That's how I teach best. But then there's another part of me that has to ask the question, but does this assessment really require me to be face-to-face? -face? Does mm -hmm. this mode of instruction really require face-to-face -face instruction or can it be facilitated online? And it's difficult, again, to, to say the very least. I don't have an answer. I've had a few colleagues that have been asking, like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? And I was like, well, this is how I'm going to do it, but I don't know if that's going to work for you. I, I can't yeah. tell you that this is the right choice, but it's it's interesting to me in this sort of pandemic time uh, to use a catchphrase that I've heard a lot of people using during this pandemic, in this pandemic time, how much I also have to satisfy my own needs, which, mm -hmm. and, and we've had similar conversations about this. I feel as a public school teacher, like so many of my colleagues, and this is not a point of praise, this is a point of criticism, I was a martyr. I was an absolute martyr that I would sacrifice my own well-being for my students. There, that's, I think that's just a casualty of teaching in public schools, is that we want the very best for our students, and so often we're underfunded or struggling for resources, and we're willing to spend the extra time at school, do the after school and before school rehearsals, even though we don't get paid for it, right? Even though there really are just systemic atrocities to the work environment and conditions of public school teachers. Now I digress because I could spend a whole hour talking about my problems with public school systems and the structures of healthy work environments for public school teachers. But I, 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 I suspect we both could, yeah. <laughs> right, like I feel, and I've said this in so many different arenas, I feel like I really escaped that. I know that my work environment, I'm not condemning everybody, I don't want to generalize, but my work environment was very unhealthy for me, mentally, spiritually, intellectually, and I really did escape a very toxic work environment um, for many different reasons. And it, it, you know, it wasn't just one thing is my point. And so I left that and here I am in academia, which has its own problems, but in terms of how I act as a teacher, the responsibilities that I have and how I get to teach, it's radically different. And I am encouraged by my institution, by my department chair, by my colleagues to take care of myself more so than I think I ever was when I was teaching public school. And so anyway, I, I say all of that because I have found my planning even more challenging because I'm not just planning for my students, which I feel like is something I did when I was a public school teacher. I wasn't worried about myself. I wanted to focus on the students. Now I feel very conscientious of but I need to be okay with this. I need to feel mm -hmm. comfortable. I would argue from talking to some of my, my colleagues that are still in public school, that the pandemic has brought that out in them as well, that they're a little more conscientious of their own health, of their family's mm -hmm. health, because of the physical risks, but also just thinking about how can I stay engaged? How can I get excited? Because the students can read right through us. They know yep. when we're faking it. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing some of those experiences of how you've been dealing with this personally, because you are in a different position than I am. Um, and you've shared this before, so I know I'm not like disclosing anything you're uncomfortable with. You have not, you know, been on campus at all because of your mm -hmm. own fears for your, your family's health. I think it was asthma you had mentioned, um, that people are suffering with in your family and just that fear of like, you are susceptible, you're a vulnerable population. So it's been different. And I think we talked about this in the summer. I have just been dying to get on camp. Like I can't, I can't teach solely for a moment. It just like melts my brain. It's not something I am capable of. And I've been so impressed with you've been doing it out of necessity and, and finding joy, finding ways to still celebrate what you're accomplishing online. So how has that been just being, we both came in at the same time. You're a you know, new faculty at your university and here it is you're like not on campus. Like, so and I know I threw a ton of stuff at you, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, it, it's funny. There were, um, 
my department had the the, the fortune. Uh, I, I was one of three full time hires uh, in in yeah. that that fall fall of nineteen, and I was joking with some of my other colleagues that. You know, uh, I, I think I've pegged it to where we've now, since we've worked here, spent more time not being there than we were actually there. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's one of those things where you're laughing and crying at the same time. Yes. <laughs> but um, I mean, and you know, I am... I, I, I'm just a social goofball. I mean, that's just kind of my nature. I mean, I, I, I get ginned up by being around folks, especially students, especially yeah. students. And, you know, there, there's that vibe, there's that energy, there's there there's a level of irreverence that I just absolutely, a, a, absolutely adore. And so having not been on in that campus environment for the last now two quarters and going on the third um, has been really depressing for me. I mean, in, 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 in a big way, uh, depressing one, because you're just not there. And, and and we try to capture as much of that as I think we can. I think we can capture pr a pretty good deal in our Zoom meetings. Uh, you know, you try to set up an environment where students feel comfortable and safe and, and, and we crack jokes back and forth and things like that. And I made some of those have been able to, to my surprise, have been able to make some of those connections. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's not the same. And, yeah. and I think from an academic point of view, I think you can make the, the argument, especially for the kinds of classes I'm teaching, that it's not necessarily inferior in terms of the intellectual, this, that, or the other it's, but it's certainly not the same. Yeah, absolutely. Now, from the social perspective, it's absolutely inferior, <laughs> you know, for, for, from the relationship building, which you know as well as I do, is is at least half the game of teaching, it's, yeah. it's especially when you're when, when you're teaching future educators for whom you are not just trying to expose to these the, these ways of thinking, these ideas, these philosophies, but you're trying to model it in how exactly. <laughs> in, 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 yeah. in how you're walking the walk. In, in, in you know in, on, on route teaching them and so that's certainly not the same thing um and so uh, uh, um i'm trying to remember exactly what your question was because here I've, I've, I've traveled um no you're answering but, i'm just ex <laughs> i'm exact i'm asking exactly what you're answering is that you know how yeah. are you dealing with this personally as a yeah. because i think you articulated very well um the professional plans that you've made sort of how you're attached you're, you're approaching your curriculum and you're trying to address student needs in terms of what they need to learn and in the larger scope of their degree plan and how does the course fit in um but you're answering my question exactly you know it's like how are we as teachers dealing with this because it's hard yeah. it is hard it's, it's hard and there is an extent to which it is just not fair for our students oh my gosh yes it's not, you know, I, um, I, I, I was talking to, it's really cool because, you know, I, I didn't travel as far for my pre previous gig as you did. Um, I taught just a few hours from where I'm sitting right now. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny uh, where I am at Western Washington University. I, I always joke where I used to teach in Port Angeles, Washington, that there's this weird Port Angeles to Bellingham pipeline. Quite a few students from most of our high schools in the state, but but certainly the one I taught at, end up at Western, and so it it, it just so happens that I have quite a few former students who oh, are wow. at my institution, some of whom actually in my department, um, and 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 at least a couple I've actually taught in classes here at Western. But anyways, uh, I was checking in with one of those students who entered as a freshman this year. I've got actually quite a few of those who I left them for their senior year, but now they're they're yeah. at Western. And and I just said, hey, so that this is right at the start of the break. So so how was your first quarter at Western? And you know, no sugar coating, no varnishing. It, it it kid said it wasn't good. It, yeah. it was it was not. It was just not. <laughs> you know, and and I've talked to a number of other students who who have spent their fall at this and other institutions who have just said this is not what I was looking forward to entering college. You know, and, and I'm thinking about that entering class of fall of 2020 who had it differently, even than the folks who came in a year before them, who had a little bit of taste of that traditional, you know, campus exactly. experience. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, for them, of course, they had it ripped away from them. Um, well, now you're looking at a class who following a spring where they didn't get the traditional graduation, the, the, no the prom, traditional no graduation, yeah. no senior nights, no. Yeah. Right. And, and their reward is that they, they, they get to go to college at the, you know, at, at the bedroom campus of whatever institution <laughs> they're at and, and, and not making those connections. Uh, the, the student I'm talking about 
is not studying music uh, uh, as a major, but one of the things they really were looking forward to was the fact that at, that at our school, we our, our music department welcomes people who major in, in other areas to come and be part of the part of the ensembles. You know, join the music mm -hmm. scene, and so this student is really looking forward to that. And oh wait. You know, I, I wanted to come. I, I wanted to start an ad hoc quartet. I wanted to do these other kinds of things, which I'm just not able to do. I'm, I'm not able to, you know, meet new people, um, form kind of those relationships. And so and so I look at that and, and my heart just breaks for all of our students, certainly, but especially the ones who have yet to experience, you know, that true first day of college, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's that. And then there's also, I was just thinking more along the social side, going back to one of the things you said about how you have freshmen f whose faces you've never seen. And, 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 and that brought me back to thinking about, you know, I'm just dreading. In a way, I'm dreading those first few days back on campus because I know this scenario is going to play out many times. Hey, Dr. Ray. Hey, how's it going? And I'm just. Yeah. You taught me for an entire year. Oh, my gosh. Right. And, 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 and in a large case, the, the, these are going to be the ones whose cameras were off Raise the entire it. time. Oh. Or if they were on, I'm looking at them through that little square you yeah. just made. And, and I don't know what. You know, and, and so I have a vague sense, if any at all, of what these students who on one level I've connected with. But I wouldn't know them walking past them in the hallway. And, and so I just I'm dreading because I'm going to feel guilty. I'm going to feel awkward. And so and so I'm just going to kind of um, I, I'm trying to steal myself to just say, hey, you know, um, I know we work together, but but just do me a favor for the next couple of weeks. Just remind me who you are. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, here, I, I, I've got these. Hello, my name is name tags. Just wear this for <laughs> days here because you know I get it, it it's it, it's kind of really challenging at at one of the things I've always tried to do a good job of as a teacher you know uh, when I was doing k-12 uh, whenever I'd encounter a new class which of course you know in our line of work we'd, we'd have students and we keep them for years but there yeah. was always you know that that new crop who came in and I would tell this I especially love doing this with middle school students I, I would have my students come in and say okay one month that is the deadline and they start getting really scared, right? And I'm, I mean, I, oh, God. That is the deadline. At the end of one month or four weeks or whatever I said, it is my job to make sure I know every single one of your names. Mm. That is my homework assignment for the next month. And then their faces start to change. And if I don't meet my goal, I, I, I come up with some zany, you know, consequence that I have. Right? And so and so and so we spend the next little bit just kind of, you know, play, playing games back and forth. But I learned my students names. Yeah, I learned their names. I learned how to spell them. I learned how to pronounce them, especially if, it, if it's one I couldn't pronounce quite, quite correctly at first. I felt like that was one of the first ways in which I showed them respect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to learn your name. It doesn't matter if it's difficult for me to pronounce. It doesn't matter if the spelling and the pronunciation doesn't necessarily jive in my mind. Doesn't matter. That's your name. Yeah. And so, so all that to say, <laughs> I know the names now from my rosters, but I can't necessarily match them to the <laughs> to the people who own them. And so, and so that 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 piece has been kind of painful, and 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 it's going to be a like I say, it, it, it's it's going to be an adjustment when we finally get back. And I'm saying when, not if, because it's going to happen. I just yeah, I I, we, I have to hold out that hope that it's going to happen, and hopefully before the end of this calendar year. You know, <laughs> that's what I've been pushing against vehemently is this phrase, the new normal, which I just despise. And I refuse to accept what it is that we're doing. And I, th I think that's so toxic for people to keep saying, well, this is the new normal. No, we can't normalize this because it's not healthy. It's not what teaching and learning should look like. And we have, you know, decades of cognitive science and, you know, human psychology that tell us that human beings don't learn best this way. There are benefits, obviously, to online learning, and there are great strides that have happened in terms of educational technology, but this is not what human beings were designed to do. And mm -hmm. and it's like, I, I just shudder every time I hear that in a meeting or I read it in a publication of, well, addressing the new normal. Like, no, we cannot normalize this. This is yeah. not normal. And my, I tell you where my heart really breaks is for student teachers right now. Mm, oh, gosh, that are dealing with this. I have a four oh. students right now that I'm supervising. And I don't, I mean, I just, it's just devastating, especially because the, the students that I'm supervising this year were, were in their junior year last year. 
So S SPU is, I mean, arguably unique um, because the institution has put a four-year stamp on every degree. So mm -hmm. for our music ed majors, where a lot of other institutions have like a ninth semester or they have a fifth year to complete an internship, uh, they are in, you know, their academic courses for three years. And then their senior year, there's another thing that SPU does. Their internship is all year long. It's mm -hmm. a full year. It's not just a quarter or two quarters. It's three quarters long. So their junior year, um, not only are they dealing with my transition of they spent their, you know, freshman and sophomore year learning with my predecessor and then their junior year as they're taking these capstone courses, they have a brand new faculty member who's trying to figure out what life is. And at the end of that junior year, a pandemic hits. So I'm, I am teaching there. And I think you have similar capstones, like an instrumental pedagogy course that just talks about secondary instrumental instruction, um, things like that. So they're taking these big capstone courses before they're going to student teach. And then now they're going into their student teaching. They have not physically been in a classroom for over a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, to this point, because any observations they were able to do, anything they were doing happened last winter was the last time they were able to be in a public school environment or even a private school environment where they were teaching. And that's devastating because as, and that's why I say I shudder when people talking about making this some sort of new normal, because for the teachers that are in training right now, this is not permanent. They yeah. will eventually be face to face. And in, in Washington, I know that I have people that kind of watch from all over. Um, but in Washington, this is highly controversial because the, the head of our education agency, um, which is the Office of Super Superintendent of Public Schools, um, our superintendent has has gone public, and I, I'm still frustrated by this. I don't know if you heard it. He did this little NPR blip, uh, and I, I'm challenged by this because I respect where he's coming from and I appreciate it, but it's one of those moments where I thought, because of the position you hold, you can't make statements like this. So he was venting his frustration of watching his own children try to learn online and it not being effective. And so he sort of talks in this interview about, we've got to get kids back in public schools. We got to get them face to face because I'm watching my kids do this and it's just not working. And so then of course, people are using that, weaponizing it to force students and teachers back into the classroom. In communities where it's, they're at incredibly high risk of infection, where it's not safe and it's not healthy, and I was so frustrated. I remember dri I was driving in the car um, with with my wife. My kids are in the car, and we're like kind of listening to NPR. And I went, "Oh my god!" And I start freaking out. My wife's like, "What?" You know, because everybody's kind of half listening because who likes to listen to the interview with the superintendent on NPR while they're driving around? That's just my life. So, you know, I'm really <laughs> into this conversation. And she goes, "What's going on?" And I'm like, "Listen!" And I turn it all the way up, and he's going on this rant about how it's not going to work. We need to get. And I was like, "I can guarantee this is going to be weaponized. I can guarantee that particularly rural schools are going to use that as an excuse." Well, the superintendent has said we need to be back, and I'm like, "No, you're taking it out of context." He's recognizing the deficiencies that exist, but it doesn't mean that we just start ignoring protocols and ignoring safety procedures so that we can get kids back in public schools. Because even then. As so many people found out, that has been sterilized in terms of the learning environments. Kids are behind plexiglass and they're wearing masks and there's no contact. And that's not necessarily healthy. That's not necessarily solving anything. It's, you know, going from trauma to trauma. So I've been, my, my heart has been breaking for all of the student teachers right now that are trying to figure out very quickly with, in most cases, very little to no preparation they're they're not mm -hmm. taking courses because we haven't developed them yet of how to teach during a pandemic how to teach exclusively <laughs> online i mean we're we're all responding to it and i mean god love them they're having to navigate that and they are going to you know god willing they're going to graduate they're going to get their certification and the first time for some of my students the very first time they're going to be standing physically in a classroom in front of students is when they get their first job mm -hmm. That's surreal. And I, yeah. I would only assume that students and parents and administrators are going to have sympathy and empathy and understand the plight that they're in. Uh, but that's, that's something I feel like we need to be talking about more is what's yeah. happening to the educators that are training right now. Not just yeah. the educators already in the field, not our freshmen and sophomores that are learning as they're going. They got four years to figure it out. What about yeah. these juniors and seniors that are right in the midst of this, you know? 
Well, you know, I, I think that's an important point. And, and I think there's some very clear, concrete uh, steps that basically districts are going to need to pick up the, the, um, the responsibility on that. And, and, and this would apply, obviously, to, to, to their new hires from any discipline, not just music. But what the districts are going to have to do, with the, knowing that they're hiring in these first-year teachers whose student teaching was, was, was to the Brady Bunch, you know, yeah. so to speak, um, which, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you experienced this in, 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 this year, too. I mean, you're observing as a faculty observer. You're, you're going into this Zoom meeting, and this teacher is trying to teach a band class or an orchestra class. And, you know, I mean, there are maybe four cameras that are on out of a class of 16 by the way there's 28 enrolled you know what i mean <laughs> and so you're wondering as a faculty member what do i even tell this student because i'm not even sure what i would do in this situation i mean you know that, that, that and i've had this conversation with a number of colleagues and student teachers it's like you know you your seat your, your cooperating teacher we're all kind of experiencing this for the first time together and and we're all and so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to point out, we're, we can, there's certain things we can find to talk about, but uh, there's so many ways I'm at a loss. So with that said, uh, to your point, these teachers are going to be walking in where their first experience uh, up front is as a teacher of record. And so the districts, for everybody's own good, for the good of the teachers, for the good of the students, for the good of everything, is they're going to have to make concrete, like dollar-infused investments in mentorship programs. Oh, They're wow. going yeah. to need to do things. I mean, I'm talking about as drastic as, you know, you're giving some of your mentor teachers, so, so some of your senior teachers, like a planned 10 days of subs. Wow. Yeah. I, I just made that number up. I, that doesn't come from anything. What, 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 yeah. Whatever something. But, but, but you're giving them paid time to leave their classroom and to go out and to actively mentor, observe, meet with you know, these, these new teachers are coming, who are coming in, who are basically going to be paid interns. I mean, let, let's just face it, you know, true, true. <laughs> and, and, and the districts, uh, you know, it, it's going, it's going to require money. It's going to require an acknowledgement that the student teaching that they had, while there are certainly things they can learn from it, they learn resilience, they learn creativity, they learn all kinds of ways of, of, of taking these learning standards, whatever they are, and translating them in a way that can work online. Their skills are coming in with that. You and I did not our first years of teaching. Let, let, I mean, let's just be clear about that. But at the same time, in terms of the traditional in-person thing, there's, a, there's obviously a lot that they missed. And so the districts are going to be doing, like I said, they're going to be doing themselves a favor, their students a favor, by making sure that these, the, these teachers have structured mentorship programs, which could include things like, you know, meetings, uh, you know, meetings uh, outside of work hours, which should be paid, by the way, <laughs> uh, yeah. where, where they're coming in, they're getting coached, they're, 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 they've got these support systems built in. Something more robust than, okay, Mr. Hansen, welcome to your first year of teaching. I know you did your student teaching online. Um, we're, we're, we're going to say that this other teacher in the room next to you is going to be your mentor teacher. You two kind of work it out and, and, and let us know how it goes at the end of the year. No, uh-uh. Like actual stuff, like have an actual district office person whose purview will include <laughs> first year teacher mentorship for the next couple of years. Yeah. You know. Um, and, and, and I think that's one of the, because basically they're going to have to backfill for the stuff that we on our side of that um, certification divide can't do to the fullest extent because, because, because. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that, that that's my thinking. And every district is going to need to invest in that, which means the state levels are going to need to make, uh, make funds, make, make resources available to those districts to be able to actively invest in that kind of thing. Because our teachers need it. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing some, some teachers, some new teachers who have the potential to just absolutely set the world ablaze. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and in order to maximize to maximize their potential to really get at their impact, we owe it to them. I say we as a broader enterprise of education owe it to them to find some way of making sure that they're set up for success and not just kind of sink or swim. Absolutely. You know, because it, the, the, there are some of those those people who can walk in and teaching for them is just like falling off a of log. They'll figure it out. They'll they, they'll put the pieces together. They'll just everything will just boom and it'll be beautiful. I don't think we should assume that it's going to that that's going to be the norm. You know, we need to be able to support and I don't mean support with regulations and thou shalt and and if you don't how dare you. I mean support as in listen. 
well, let, 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 let's sit down, let's figure out your planning. And I'm talking about this is way back in August or June or July, I mean, you know, whenever, but prior to our school year starting. Tell me, tell me what you're thinking about in terms of this, that, or the other. Here's the curriculum from the teacher who came mm-hmm. before you. Mm-hmm. What are we looking at here? And, and, and you're absolutely with them every step of the way. Right. We've got to do that. And, and, and otherwise, you know, the, the, this fear, which I think is a little bit overblown, this fear of the lost generation. Of, what, what are they calling it? The, 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 the current school students who are losing year of instruction? Yeah, lost, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a little bit overblown. But I think you can make that a self-fulfilling prophecy if you don't do a good job to reinforce the uh, to reinforce the skills and, 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 and uh, provide resources for our new teachers. Well, and it's so. I mean, I, I don't want to go too far on this tangent, but I, I'm glad you brought it up because I've said this a couple times during some other teacher talks that we really haven't experienced something like this sociologically since World War II. That every citizen across the world has been affected by something that has changed their daily life. And so there is there is both something very powerful about being united by a common struggle um, and also very damning to what the the psyche and the social realities are for that generation that has to live through that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't want to I'm I don't I don't I'm not scared. I don't that's not the right word, but I am anxious to see how that plays out. Um, We're specifically talking about future teachers that are preparing to go into the classroom and what that's going to look like. But I agree too, there's some melodrama and sort of the lost generation or referencing the students that are going through this experience. But needless to say, they are going to have a different worldview. They Mm -hmm. are going to have, you know, case in point, I remember talking to one of my freshmen about this. So, and actually, uh, I have uh, twin baby brothers that are 18 years old, um, big age, 18 years younger than me, and they are in their senior year right now in high school. And so I have talked to them a little bit, and I talked to one of my incoming freshmen um, about like not having prom, not having a graduation, and what that means. And a couple of the students I have talked to have sort of been like, man, you know, I'm not it sucks and I wanted to do it, but I'm not that worried about it. And I knew so many people like that, that it kind of blew off the idea of um, institutional traditions and who cares. It's not a big deal. And then went and really enjoyed it. And for me, I am, Oh my God, I love, I love graduations. I'm that weirdo that absolutely loves the regalia and pomp and circumstance and all of it primarily because the United States is one of the only countries that actually has some sort of a ceremony when you graduate, you know, grade school, when you graduate high school. Um, and a lot of other countries, it's just this thing that you do. There's not a big celebration. In general, the idea is graduations are not celebrated. Um, the concept of a prom is something that's sort of situated in Western culture of like your school organizing this dance and what it is. And it it's This does scare me to a certain extent that we are starting to challenge a lot of these cultural traditions that we have, and they may or may not disappear. What that does is then open up this huge conversation of what is the purpose of a school? Mm -hmm. Is it really meant to socialize and and produce culture among students? And I, I shudder to think that too many people have not understood the gravity of that. Um, I don't know if we have a lost generation, but we definitely have a generation of students that no longer have reverence for something like an in-person graduation or something like a prom. There are a lot of students that are like, well, it didn't happen, and so it doesn't really bother me. So when when they mature into adulthood, and if they decide to have children and have children, how much are their parents going to care about that? How much are their parents going to care about assemblies, about concerts, about sporting events? about those things have been taken away and quote unquote, you know, students are still surviving. Um, I'm, I'm worried about how that plays out. Now, I'm not trying to promote a sense of fear and I, I'm not just being pessimistic. Um, I'm also not trying to be dramatic and kind of going from, oh, prom got canceled to we're no longer going to offer music in school, but I'm not ruling that out. 
because I think that's a valid thing to consider is we have seen a lot of districts in the state of Washington that have furloughed art teachers mm -hmm. because they're claiming they don't know how to make it work or that it's not feasible. And students in the state of Washington are having secondary experiences in which the state is tracking the credits that they achieve in order to award a high school diploma. They are having an experience that doesn't include music, that doesn't include theater, that doesn't include dance. They are having these experiences and then going out into the world. And that does produce a generation that appreciates and understands the arts, that appreciates extracurricular activities in a radically different way than we've ever experienced before. And anyone that is blessed to have a family member that lived through World War II, which we do still have quite a few, you know, uh, citizens that have, have recollection of that lived through it in their formative years, it, you only have to talk to them to understand the appreciation that they have for um, capitalism, the appreciation that they have for rubber, you know, like having to go through shortages of goods and and understanding this communal effort to support a war and having to go without and sacrifice. And, you know, anyone that's had a Thanksgiving or a Christmas with that generation knows They're like, well, I remember, you know, it doesn't take long for them to remind you of how fortunate you are. Um, sure. And I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit comical, but I, I think we can look to our very near future our very near past to say yeah this is going to have a generational effect and what is it no we're not rationing you know rubber we're not rationing milk or meat but we do have a ration on the arts right now i don't think that it's foolish to say that because professional organizations have started to fold where people have not been able to go to the concerts and participate in arts events whether it's visual art dance theater music whatever it is and so what does that mean in terms of generational change of how people perceive that? Is there going to be this yearning that I think we're seeing from Generation Z, Generation Y of, oh, I miss going to the movies. I miss going to live concerts. I miss this. The longer that this lasts, the more it does become normalized and the more people are going to say, well, I don't know if I'm worried about it. I hope that rant made sense. Yeah, you know, I, I it, it's it's a lot to think about. You know, I I wonder though because I, I my immediate sense is that absence makes the heart go grow fonder, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, because the, the reports I was getting back, you know, go, going back to your thing with, with work with high school students this past spring, you know, overwhelmingly the ones I talked to or heard from were just lamenting the lack of yeah. prom, the lack of this past fall, the lack of homecoming, you know, and, and on all these different things. And and, and I can't, I, I wonder, I don't have any empirical anything to, to support one way or the other, but I wonder if some of those students who were saying, yeah, I didn't really need it anyway, were going to be the same ones who were going to bring like the air horn of the graduation or who were going to prank this or the other thing. I mean, I, I wonder if it's that same population who weren't ever going to take it seriously to begin with. You know, and, 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 and so the optimistic side of me says, gee, I hope that's all that was, you know, uh, rather well, than. I, I want to reiterate, I think what scares me is, um, you know, Dewey tells us experience is the greatest form of learning. Yeah. And I think that's what scares me is the skeptics which there are usually a lot because I mean let's just let's just face facts right the the younger generations my god I, how old am I those young whippersnappers but <laughs> younger generations of students and I absolutely saw this when I was teaching um, they pride themselves on having some sort of a sarcastic sardonic wit which truth be told I resemble and so I was really into that I loved being super sassy and sarcastic with my students yeah. and I absolutely appreciated that but there was a certain point at which I would be able to draw a line in the sand and say yeah I'm being sarcastic and I might be making fun of something but I really do appreciate whatever this event is that we're participating yeah. this practice and a lot of what changed my students mind was them experiencing it I think that's what I'm afraid of is you're you're absolutely right. There's a small population of students that just don't appreciate it and wouldn't appreciate it anyway. But there are a lot of people that are skeptical in in, in context of this conversation of the arts in general, mm -hmm. that the minute they go to see their kid in their first concert, that spark, you know, I, obviously I just watched the movie Soul. And so I'm thinking about that spark. Don't tell me. No, no spoilers. Every oh, time I no see spoilers. it, I scroll past. No, you gotta I, watch I, I haven't it. done it yet. Yeah, you got to watch it. <laughs> 
um, I will. I'm excited. So for everybody that's seen it out there, hashtag soul is a good movie. La, 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 and um, <laughs> but you know, for a lot of people, there are those moments where that's what lights them up. Is that like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm seeing my kid play the trombone for the first time, and I want to support that. I want to. I'm going to push them and I encourage them to do this. And I'm worried that as the longer that we don't have those things. They we start to lose it. Same thing. You mentioned this a little earlier about encouraging non-music majors to participate in music making, uh, which is the, primarily the orchestra that I work with at SPU. And I'm afraid because a lot of the students that I had that were in this freshman class, hey, I want to keep playing my cello. Great. Come join the orchestra. They're not getting what they wanted. They mm -hmm. wanted to be in person. They wanted to. The, and they have been so respectful and so understanding you know, of this weird circumstance we're in. They're kind of writing it out but they absolutely lament like this just isn't the same like i don't know if mm -hmm. i want to do this and i'm so terrified that if they yeah. I, and i appreciate your sentiment i did absence does make the heart grow fonder but i am and again i don't want to sound pessimistic but i'm worried of the opposite that i think that they're going yeah. to see it as well I, then i don't really need this mm -hmm. and then i lose those students <laughs> i feel yeah. like i'm just being so pessimistic <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think I think that if we were to look at another full year, like the one we're in the middle of mm. now, and a third year, and and I think if we were to stretch out, kind of like to your, to your point earlier, the longer this goes on, I think the more, I think the more that really does start to rise to a level of serious concern, like serious yeah. concern. Um, I am, as, as I said before, I'm kind of working off the assumption that by the time fall rolls around. We'll more or less be getting back into gear, right? And 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 those students, those anthropology majors who just wanted to keep playing their cello, they will be so starved, hmm. right? They will be so, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I had to go a whole year without this. They'll be beating down your door. Yeah, I mean that's my that's my maybe it's a little Pollyanna, but that's my <laughs> hope of of what we're heading towards. Here. Absolutely. And, but 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 I do think that you know to the extent I may be onto something, I don't think we can just sit back and wait for them to knock. Yeah. Right. Maybe that means we have to put even as early as our recruiting efforts. I'm, I'm still trying to figure what that means. But our recruiting efforts, as, as we're talking to high schoolers this year, um, talk about, you know, uh, really playing up the fact that, you know, it's OK if, if, if your intent is to major in bioengineering. You know, we have a program here at SPU or WWU or whatever school we're having to fill in the blank um, where our st or students from all across the campus are, 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 are engaged and they're available to do this. It was like that before the pandemic. And now that we're starting to wrap things up, now that, you know, the campus is is, is we're vaccinated enough to where things are starting to open up again. We are so excited to get that started again. We want you to come in and, and be part of the rebirth of the SPU yeah. campus orchestra or whatever you call it. I don't, I don't know what your groups are called, but you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and, and I think if that we're able, if it, it's all about selling, right? It's all about, we, we just have to, we have to, have to up our marketing game a, a bit, don't we? And, and then maybe our professional organizations too. Maybe there's a role for NAFME or, you know, and our local state affiliate WMEA and, and, and the other folks that are out there. Maybe there's a role in, you know, uh, kind of forestalling any shenanigans that might be uh, playing out in the minds, not not just at, at, the, at the college level. Where, where, where I see your fear uh, playing out most likely is at the K-12 level. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about those districts and those places where, you know, you have people as part of those communities who have just been looking and waiting for any excuse yeah. Any excuse to 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 put the screws to their arts programs, a a including places where you know if if you if you if you step back and take a look at things, your arts programs are among the programs, not the only, but among among the programs that are keeping students in school to begin with. Yes, absolutely. They keep showing up to campus because man, I I I'm in this play, I'm in this production with with with, with the, the, the the drama club, and I've got this role, or I'm, I'm I'm on stage crew, or I sing in the choir, or I do this. That's what's getting them in there. Right. And not just like I said, not just arts. So there's the athletics. There's some of the other programs, ROTC, JRTC, those things. But I mean, but there are people who still for who, for whatever reasons, don't consider what we're doing as artists meaningful, who, who still kind of have it fixed in their brains that it's just fluff stuff that's getting in the way of real academics. And by the way, as an aside, I always I always take people to task anytime they try to put a dichotomy between the, the arts programs and the academics. And I said, mm -hmm. hold on. Music is academic. 
Yes. Uh, to, like, try to say that some, somehow we're not part of the academics, but that, that's a whole, oh gosh, I could do another hour just on that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but, but, but people who've just been looking for ways to push us out of the way so that they can offer more STEM or they can offer more reading support or, or more this, that, or the other thing. Yeah. Which isn't to say that those things aren't important. Of course they are. But but people who have been looking f- as uh, looking to displace the arts, they will seize upon any opportunity. And so I think that does mean in terms of um, I, I, I cringe whenever I hear the word advocacy. I'm sorry. It's just for me, it's one of those terms that's just overused. But. I can't think of a better one right now. So thinking of a way that we as, as, as professionals and professional societies can really talk about, I mean, point to the pandemic itself as a reason for why we need to be there. Yeah. Look at what's happened. Okay, fine. I mean, you want to take off the take off the gloves? Fine. Look at what's happening to economies, uh, to local economies, because the music venues are closing down. The restaurants and bars that can no longer bring in the bands or this, that, or the other, and, and, and that on top of the closures and lockdowns, they're losing revenue. Right. Yeah. The ways in which I mean, I, I think we can look at the pandemic to look at all the various different ways in which the arts are an absolutely integral, integral part of everything we're doing in society. Right. Not not just folks who are just going in and, and, and playing around for half an hour and then they're going to, you know, go, go back to doing real life, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and so I think uh, I think to to put a barrier between your worst fears and to talk about in terms of people saying, oh, look, we, we just survived a whole year, year and a half without all this stuff. We don't maybe we don't really need it. I think, no, we point to them and say, this is what we've lost. And this is this. This is what we now stand to gain by not just returning to but redoubling our investments, redoubling yeah. our efforts in promoting all of these things we're doing along with I'm going back to K-12, along with the STEM and, and the reading and all these other things. Of course, of course, they're important. I mean, God, we got to vaccine because of STEM. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I'm not on that thing that's saying that it's that it's over. Yeah, of course it is, right? But that doesn't mean that these other pieces, these other pieces that are part of the larger curricular pie, are somehow we can just kind of discard them, right? I, I think I think if if we can point to ways in which our students lives have been uh, uh, negatively impacted, I think there is a fantastic case to be made that part of it is because they don't have that regular access to the arts and these other, these other, these other things. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, time will tell. Um, and I, I wouldn't dare project either way, but I really do appreciate the sentiment that I think we both share and that you articulated that we can't just wait for people to knock on the door. Yeah. I think that's, if I were to target any specific anxiety that I'm having right now, I think that's what it is, is that I want to see a more concentrated effort from from my colleagues, from our colleagues, to start, even though you don't like this word, advocating, right? Advocating for the arts and public school and curriculum development and say, great, let me sit at the table with you. Let me be a part of this conversation so that we don't get mm-hmm. left out because it's not just, I've heard so many districts, you know, talking about, well, this pandemic has proven that we need to have more technology in the classroom. Okay. I, I think that's not necessarily untrue. Yeah. More technology integration is great. Technology keeps advancing and we should be advancing with it, but that doesn't mean that we cut things. Right. That means that we add, that means that we enhance. It doesn't mean that we have to start making choices and let alone that the choices should be getting rid of certain types of learning, right, or certain curriculum or certain disciplines. We should be enhancing things through technology. And I was always, <coughs> excuse me, I was always grateful um, for colleagues that I worked with in educational technology that understood that. And I wish I could uh, sort of attribute the quote um, to a specific individual, but I remember it was a sentiment that was shared. They would always say, technology is a tool. Mm-hmm. Technology is a tool. Technology is not the answer. It's a tool. And tools are only as good as those that are trained to use them. So the more you understand about technology, the more you can integrate it into your classroom, the more your students can benefit. I think those are all truths. But mm-hmm. the less we know about technology, the less often we use it, it's going to exist. It's not going to do us any good. And I don't think that we have the luxury of just sort of waiting to see what's going to happen. I think that we have to be proactive and be looking forward, thinking forward and talking to, I mean, even with my, my freshmen, I have, I have been having more serious conversations with them about 
the foundations of music education and the philosophy of education and why we do what we do and how we do what we do. Things that last year I thought, oh, I should relegate this to upperclassmen and people that are student teaching and have these just like, no, we're going to talk about it right now. Your mm -hmm. first class with me, we're going to dive deep into this because these are things that your career is going to uh, depend upon is how you define the significance of what you do. Advocacy is going to be a required part of your job. It's no longer something that only rural teachers have to deal with or only small programs have to deal with. We are all going to have to deal with having that conversation eventually of why should we keep your program? Why should we keep giving you money here? Why do we need to keep an inventory of all these instruments? Can't we just have a tech, a music tech class? Can't all the students just learn music on a computer? Yes, they can. But I do think we still need an analog experience. I do think I still need to hand a violin to somebody and have them play it. Um, yeah, this is amazing. I can't, it's the time always goes so fast. I can't believe it's already been an hour. Um, <laughs> James, I just love talking with you and, Likewise. and sharing these ideas. Uh, I want to respect your time and mine as I both, we are, <laughs> I know both of us are trying to prepare very quickly for tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, but as always, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to sort of book in this conversation. And uh, I look forward to talking to you more and having you on another teacher talk. For those of you that were watching, if you have any questions or comments, the conversation doesn't end now. Please feel free to reach out to us and join this conversation or start your own conversation in your community about what's going on. How are we preparing for the future and this incredible time we're living through? Um, thank you again so much, James, and to everybody that watches this, whether it's on the archives and our YouTube channel or if you were able to watch it live, please feel free to share it. As we continue to physically distance ourselves, we do not have to distance ourselves emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually. Keep talking to each other, stay connected, and stay safe. See you guys next week. Thank you. Oh, see, this is the problem when you have two screens. I got to get my mouse back over to this one. There we go. <laughs>